को तो प्रेस करके तो ऑफ हो गया ये ये हम हेलो त्रिशांत बैकस्टेज बैकड्रॉप बैकड्रॉप डालो बैकड्रॉप आ ये ये और बैकड्रॉप डालो Good evening. All are kindly requested to take your seats, please. People who are standing, we kindly request you to take your seats, please. A few can come into the front rows. There are a few seats available here. The star of the day, Salman Soz, is requested to come to the front, please. <laughs> Sanjeev, when they move, you know you can. Yes, whatever you want. Ladies and gentlemen, very warm good evening to all of you. It is really warm outside. <laughs> yes, if not <laughs> more. So, this is the first time we are doing one of our uh, book launches inside a bookstore. Really, really beautiful, thanks to Tidal Waves you know, for giving us this venue. Um, let me introduce uh, the star of the day, the star uh, face of the day, the author, and one of our own, Salman Soz. His background is that of a public economist, development finance specialist, worked with uh, World Bank and consulted with Asian Development Banks. He's based out of, he's partly working from the US and partly working from India, you know, so he's shuttling between two countries. Uh, US is his half girlfriend at this point of time. <laughs> <laughs> and um, he is also the national election coordinator of AIPC as well as the regional coordinator of North Zone. And he is been of tremendous support for the Congress party in terms of engaging with the intellectual community 
uh, in both the sides of the world. So, not only from his book's perspective, it also gives a lot of meaning for AIPC activities to have one amongst us authoring a book and reaching out to the intellectual world and the professional world about the reasoning of this disappointment you know, which we have faced in the last five years' time. What we are really seeing now is the people, the educated people who are well educated becoming illiterate and then fighting the battle of saying that the current ruler is the best. I often find it difficult because most of these business leaders are the ones who detail it out through the Excel sheets to the best of the details, even for a hundred dollars or a hundred rupees spent, and finds reasons and logic on their business decisions. But when it comes to lies, detecting lies or you know verifying lies, you know they somehow become suddenly blind and then fight this battle. And you know, it is difficult to convince somebody who pretends to stay blind than convincing somebody who is really illiterate and who is not aware. This is the biggest challenge which the country is facing right now. It is not a Congress party issue, it is not a BJP issue, it is not, it is the issue of this country. We are being bombarded with the marketing principle of repeating a lie for a thousand times and no making that lie a truth. It's a, it's a battle which we have to fight to the nail. It's a battle which we have to fight with a lot of conviction where we have no supporting from many corners who could have supported us, but it's a battle which we have fought very vigorously. So, having said that, I have set the stage for the day and I request the author of the, uh, the star of the day and the author of the book, The Great Disappointment, Salman Sauce, to take the stage, please. Whichever. We are left center, you know, so you know we can. <laughs> <laughs> then uh, <laughs> Sanjay Jha is a household name now, you know, for AIPC as well as you know for all the invitees. If I give him an introduction, then I might face, I might have to face tomatoes to my face. <laughs> so before they get into the conversation, I would request to do a small official launch of the book in Mumbai by. Salman giving the first copy to Sanjay, followed with Sumed and me. Sumed, I request Vice President uh, of Maharashtra, APC, to come to the stage along with us. Thank you. I'll leave it to Sanjay and uh, to take it forward from here. Yep. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for being here this evening. And uh, welcome Salman to Mumbai. Half girlfriend and stuff, I just heard. Hopefully, you'll be fully married to India after post May 23rd. Yeah. Uh, the reason why we have uh, our faces on the screen is to convince you that we are not imposters. Uh, in this day and age, you never know. <laughs> what you see is not necessarily what you get. Salman, I've read your book. Um, a lot of it we chat about very often. Uh, so we're going to make this into a fast and furious conversation. Okay? Mumbai is a restless city. Uh, we want to keep them on their toes. You agree with that, Mohini? Yeah? yeah? And the idea is that you know economics by its very nature is a very heavy 
subject stats data manrega food security you know people just get kind of get a little overwhelmed by all that so we'll try and simplify it but most important we will face the facts as they are my first question to you is going to be that i am actually disappointed with the title of your book i know you're stunned in my personal opinion it should have been called the great disaster over to you. Thank I you. think the last five years under Modi, in the last five years, if you look at the economic issues that we have touched, uh, by saying the great disappointment, have you been too kind to the current government? Uh, well, first, thank you so much to you, Sanjay, to Sumay, then to Matthew, and to all of you for hosting me, for giving me this opportunity to talk a little bit about uh, what this labor of love. And um, I know that. Uh, this is not the first time, actually, uh, people have told me that the title of the book should have been something different. They wondered why I call, call it The Great Disappointment, and why not, um, oh, there's my old buddy Kaushik and Shreya. Okay, uh, uh, when I released this book in Delhi, uh, Raga Bell at the Quint uh, said, this should be The Great Betrayal, uh, yeah. not The Great Disappointment. And of course, Sanjay feels that this should be the great, uh, great disaster. But let me tell you why, uh, why I named it this way. Um, on May 16, 2014, I was at the Congress headquarters. The results were pouring in. All spokespersons of the Congress party, which includes Sanjay and me, had been asked to report to our uh, headquarters to be on TV from 7 AM to 11 PM that evening. And uh, pretty, uh, pretty much very quickly, as results started coming in, we knew that this was a disaster for the Congress party. And uh, while I was taking a beating on television, uh, one channel after another, everybody was saying, you were decimated, and what did you guys do, and all that stuff. Inside, I was thinking, oh my god, these guys are uh, going to, the way they've been talking about things, they're going to be here forever, not for one term. Certainly, maybe two terms, maybe more, because the talk was so good. And I knew the kinds of things they were talking about, uh, from jobs uh, to, uh, you know, if you remember, uh, the f from the farm to the dining table, agriculture, all those kind of wonderful things, investment and manufacturing and all the stuff. I said they're not going to lose. So on the one hand, I was like, oh my god, they're going to win again, and we're out for a long time. On the other, and I said, you know, as a congressperson, I felt bad, because I felt that uh, along with all this development talk, I, I felt that there was this other part of the RSS and the BJP, which, which was not going to be good for the country. But then at some level, I said, you know what, there's so many poor people in this country. This country is poor. There's so many poor people who are trying to kind of make a living maybe because of this person who's been given an opportunity, first party in 30 years to have a single party government, maybe, you know, they'll do things really well. And, uh, you know, uh, maybe at least these poor people will benefit. But they did not. So as a citizen, I was hoping, as a citizen, not as a Congress party person, but as a citizen, that they would do well for the poor people of this country. Unfortunately, uh, it did not happen, and that's why I call it the great disappointment, because I was disappointed. Okay, uh, but, but you know, I'm going, to, I'm going to pose a tough one to you there. This is not yeah. an unscripted. No, 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 no. So <laughs> this, this is, is, this is totally unscripted. Huh? He and I are friends, but you know, he doesn't know exactly what I'm going to ask him. Uh, so I've got a tough one for you. Uh, you say as a citizen of India, you were disappointed. But you know, you are not a citizen completely, right? You're also a politician. You represent the Congress party. And you and I are aware. And that, that's the reason why I read your book. I wanted to ask you this question publicly. He doesn't know what's coming. You say that you were disappointed and you thought Modi and the government will work for the poor. But you, Salman Sos, you were fully aware of the Gujarat model, which I believe, and I'm being blunt about it, is the biggest con job ever committed. The Gujarat model was about crony capitalism. The Gujarat model was about running into huge debt. The Gujarat model was about actually making the poor more impoverished. In the Gujarat model, one of the biggest business houses got 30,000 acres of land to produce a car which is now out of business. 
and it was given to them with some, and they had some loans given to them at 0% interest rate. So I'm just going to come back to you on that one. When you say you were disappointed, I mean, how on earth were you so bullish that Modi will do anything for the poor? It, it's, it's not uh, that the I was... The heat is on. The, it's not that I was bullish. In fact, if you, uh, th there's a table that, uh, that talks about uh, a comparison between Kerala and Gujarat on, uh, on uh, social development indicators. And my argument uh, in the book is that given Gujarat's per capita income, uh, which is m uh, much higher than uh, most of the states, the social development indicators have just not kept uh, pace. And that is uh, a terrible thing. It's not uh, that I was bullish. Of course, I, was, I wasn't bullish. Let's just say that it was the triumph of uh, uh, hope over what I knew. Yeah. So it was, you know, I was being hopeful for the country, frankly. I was uh, really being hopeful for those uh, who had been left behind despite the fact that we've grown and all that. Uh, so it was, it was hope, you know, it was nothing else. I mean, uh, uh, you've got to, you know, you, 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 uh, you know, for example, in Kashmir, you see, you see poverty, you know, and uh, by the way, and there's so many places in the rest of the country that are far poorer. People are living in penury. Uh, you just have to kind of, uh, you know, keep your eyes open. You know, many times what happens is that people like, uh, you know, we're middle class people and we kind of get used to our own lives. But there are people who are desperately surviving. And I think that is why, you know, there's this hope that, okay, now maybe uh, the Gujarat model, I knew about it, I'd written about it. Uh, but uh, but I, it was just, uh, I was hoping that Delhi would kind of um, make him a prime minister. Uh, but I think... As opposed to, yeah, the, the Gujarat fiefdom. But here's a question. Do you feel, you and I are, were part of that brigade that fought uh, for the party when its fortunes were swinging down. Uh, I don't know how many of you in the audience are aware of this data, but actually dispassionate economists, I'm not talking about people who are, you know, having any soft corner for the Congress party, would agree. Mihir Sharma wrote the column where he called the 2004 to 14 as the golden period of Indian economy. Because during this, this time, ladies and gentlemen, India actually grew at around anywhere over 8% for several years. In UPA1, over 8.3% was the average GDP growth rate. It crossed 10% at one point. And even in UPA2, the much maligned UPA2, the growth on average was 735 and this government has not been able to cross that. Its average is below that number. Although, they Although, yeah, I mean, they revised it. The truth is this. On growth, it did better. We did better in both UPA 1 and 2. Despite being a coalition government, the Congress didn't have an absolute majority. Oil prices crossing $150 a barrel. And the fact that you had the worst, worst recession in 2008. This... Mr. Modi's government has had oil prices at $29 a barrel. He's had less than 28. Yeah, 26 at some stage. Uh, a fully majority government, so stability was never his problem. And a very stable world economy. So I'm linking that to the point. And we lifted 270 million people out of poverty. It's not even 140 million. That, yeah, UNDP, yeah, yeah, UNDP report says 270 million people out of poverty. Which country in the world other than China ever registered such high growth rates and lifted people out of poverty and then got reduced from 206 seats in parliament to 44. That's my question for you. Do you think that the UPA 1 and 2, basically the Congress party, marketed itself terribly during the 2014 elections? Malul, these are data, right? I'm not giving you I a think, rhetoric. Yeah. I, I personally feel that uh, uh, the fatigue had set in. Um, uh, you know, after uh, two terms, there was fatigue. There's also uh, 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 every scandal, uh, you know, did really kind of become big in the public uh, public eye. In fact, uh, when the when the 2G uh, thing happened, some of us uh, had actually kind of uh, started asking very basic questions, which economists normally ask, and we just say, okay, let us just ask you the following question. Uh, where are tariffs in the world? Where are they really, really low? And then it turns out in India, tariffs for mobiles are extremely low, extremely low, right? Among the lowest in the world. What policy does that? The policy that does that is where you actually give, you know, you basically tell people spectrum is available, you make something out of it. So instead of the government taking the revenues, 
basically it's transferred to people in the form of lower payments, <coughs> lower bills. But there wasn't, there, wasn't, there wasn't any opportunity because the public mood had soured, uh, partly because of that, because of, because of the anti-corruption movement, the India against um, uh, corruption movement, uh, which by the way had been hijacked uh, also. I mean, I don't know how many people know, but the India against uh, corruption NGO, the entire Arvind K. J. Wal, Anna Hazare movement was actually funded by the RSS. How many people know that? So, uh, uh, and also uh, in, in the wake of uh, uh, in the, wake of the 2008 crisis and uh, a, uh, a second uh, kind of recession that hit in 2010-11, uh, uh, fiscal deficits started going up, uh, inflation hit. So it was a perfect storm of bad news. And, and then, of course, all these scandals uh, that kept popping up. And a very, very effective uh, uh, campaign, I think. Uh, you got to give uh, the BJP uh, a lot of credit for that. And also, uh, they had a messenger, which they lacked until then. Uh, so I think all of these things came together, and that perfect storm basically blew us out of the water. So. Uh, but you know that's what it is. You know sometimes you have these kinds of things. It was. It was that's exactly why I say it's the great disappointment. Now you had everything. You had a person who could not be questioned at that time. He was the most popular leader at that time, and uh, and uh, uh, he had been built up as uh, the great administrator, the decisive leader, and. Uh, Unfortunately, uh, what unfolded, as I note in the book, uh, is very different from what we had been given to believe. So, yeah, I mean, I mean you know, the point that I would like to add, and maybe uh, you know, it's important for us to actually share it with the audience, and, and please ask us questions when we wrap up. But those allegations, they were those scandals were allegations. The 2G has been thrown out by the courts by saying it's nothing but a fabrication. So here was a Congress party which was being blown apart by allegations of 1,86,000 crores and 1,76,000 crores that was run by the media. And the media was you know, totally hostile towards the Congress. But I'm saying at the end of the day, we didn't defend ourselves against ridiculous allegations because those corruption charges, by the way, you have in Narendra Modi and Amit Shah, two very vindictive people. So if there were really genuine issues, you would have found many people jailed at the moment. That never happened. Yeah. So, I mean, the Congress allowed itself to bleed on corruption. And my unanswered question, we still did not market what we achieved well. I mean, these were achievements. Bandrega happened during the UPA time. For God's sake, I mean, you know, uh, this is a question that you and I have faced very often. Uh, when we talk of corruption, RTI was brought in by the Congress party, the biggest anti you know, corruption, transparent, uh, you know, law. The Lokpal bill was brought in by the, by the Congress party. Did you see a Lokpal appointed in five years? The act was passed by the, by the Congress party through legislation, dialogue, public protest. It was made into an act. For five years, Modi could not even appoint a Lokpal. That's the point I'm making. Do you think we, we were not good at marketing ourselves at all? Well, we didn't really talk a lot about uh, uh, what we had done, and I think that that is also because uh, the prime minister's nature was to, you know, I want to get my work done. You know, I don't think he's Dr. Manmohan Singh was not given to flamboyance and other things. So, uh, so I think it was all about let's just get the work done. Uh, and I think he he's he was not self promotion. Let's just say that. Uh, but perhaps in this modern age uh, now. Uh, we've realized that, uh, you know, uh, especially the way the BJP has marketed itself, uh, that uh, you have to, uh, you have to put, you have to inform people what you're doing. Uh, and I, I think we, we did not do that uh, enough, or even well, or well enough. Um, but as you might have noticed now, uh, towards the end of uh, its term, the elections are upon, uh, upon us, and the Modi government is actually not talking a lot about what it has done. Uh, it is talking about everything. Uh, except that, uh, yeah. except that. Um, uh, and by the way, that is despite control of vast sections of the media, yeah, uh, despite come uh, to that. Uh, yeah. um, uh, access to a lot of resources, which frankly is uh, incredible. I mean, the way I see it, uh, um, all the, the entire opposition put together has no, uh, cannot compete with the resources that the BJP has. Um, so, and you know, uh, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a tough thing, but you know, I actually tried in the book uh, to, because I knew that I was, you know, I'm from the Congress party, I knew that people would feel that, okay, this is 
one more political hit job or something. So I've tried very much to kind of stay, uh, you know, uh, stay relatively apolitical. I don't think, I think it's very hard for people who are po in politics to suppress their uh, kind of uh, uh, worldview. Uh, but I've tried to do that in this book. In fact, I actually uh, talk, uh, talk about some of the good things that uh, the Modi government has done also. I mean, uh, so no government, by the way, uh, uh, there's no government that does only bad things. But then you have to weigh the evidence against what the promises were. And one of the uh, things that motivated me to write this book, uh, apart from the constant kind of nagging by uh, Penguin, uh, was, uh, uh, which by the way, I must thank Swati Chopra from Penguin, who for two years was after me that I should write. And I was like, I'm so scared of writing. I don't want to write. Writing a book, writing the article is easier. But, um, uh, but one of the motivations was, if you remember, the prime, uh, prime minister, when he was candidate Modi, said, that you gave them 60 years, give me 60 months. Uh, and uh, that I felt was very disrespectful to those who came before Prime Minister Modi. And I wanted to understand what exactly the others were about. Uh, as in what did they, you know, uh, so uh, you know, the first chapter is called Inheritance. Yeah. What did everybody inherit when they became Prime Minister? What did Jawaharlal Nehru inherit? What, what, was the, what was India about? I mean, Jawaharlal Nehru inherited six million refugees and a country that did not have enough food. The country that had seen a devastating famine in West Bengal, or in Bengal those days, right? Millions died. So that was what he, uh, what he had inherited. If you remember, if you read the first finance minister's first budget speech, it is all about food. It's not about anything else, food. And uh, compare that to what others received, including Prime Minister Modi, and then to kind of say that I will do in 60 months what others uh, did not do in 60 years, uh, to my mind, uh, frankly, was uh, very, very disrespectful. I, in some ways, took it, you know, I, I took it to heart, and then I w set out to see what others had gone through, and I document that in the first part. Yeah, and I think, uh, you know, th this is the point. I mean, how many people know Saban? And uh, maybe the audience here knows, but when you look at India, it's a complex polity with many people who don't have access to education or internet. That 70% of India was living below the poverty line in 1947. That the average life of an Indian born at that time was 30 or 32. 32 you were not expected to live beyond 32 years of age. Now you're at, I think, crossing 70. No, 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 no. It's, it, it, yeah, it's much more than that. Uh, in which case, good luck, Sanjeev Bhatra. But you know, I, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna say, if you, if you, if you look at, if you look at, for example, the level of literacy is is crossing re nearing around 80 percent. I mean, India has gone far, and and if anybody has built this country over the most difficult times, it has been people like Pandit Nehru. How do you respond to it? Because you know, you can't delink economics with politics. You know, the more I read your book. I thought it was a very sweet, uh, generous Salman Soz, uh, trying very hard to be apolitical, make, to, wanting to make a political statement, but trying to still explain it in a, in a giving it the economic rationale. But can we deal in politics? I mean, l l let's ap approach it logically. You know, when Modi goes to town and says India was the fastest growing economy, you think, well, 70 years ago, nothing was done, Modi became Pradhan Mantri, ban gaya, and suddenly India became the fastest growing economy. For God's sake, that India was faster growing during the UPA time, but because China was growing at 12%, we were second fastest growing economy. Because China came to b below 7%, we became the fastest growing economy. <laughs> Actually, th this, uh, uh, of course, you can't, uh, uh, you know, you can't delink uh, your own political convictions completely. And I, I, you know, you're right. I've, I've been, I've been, I've tried to be uh, as even-handed as possible. Yeah. Uh, you know, when when uh, uh, Prime Minister Modi talks about uh, all the things, the vision of the uh, BJP and vision of the Prime Minister, and all the big things, he's like sounds like a man in a hurry. If you will allow me, I'll read a short passage from yeah, yeah. from Please the do. 1950s, Please and uh, it might just give you a sense of what people uh, were doing then. So, so now keep this in, uh, keep this in mind that uh, we are, uh, you know, these days we're told that uh, Prime Minister Modi man, are working all the time, so wants big things for the country. And he works 22 so, hours a day. So this so country, that. that at the turn of independence, the biggest challenge was what? 
food, and also, of course, 6 million refugees. 60 lakh, and by the way, that, that refugee crisis was the second biggest refugee crisis out, outside of World War II. So, just a short paragraph. In the desire for rapid development, the founders, as in India's founders, displayed breathtaking ambition. Since food production was of critical importance initially, the first government under Pandit Nehru focused on expanding India's irrigation capacity. Chester Bowles, an American diplomat, noted in an opinion piece that India embarked on creating three large dam systems, Dabadur, Hirakud, and Bhakra Nangal, that had an irrigation capacity 70% more than that of the Grand Coulee in the US state of Washington, which at that time was the largest irrigation system in the world. So the first prime minister of one of the poorest countries in the world sets out to beat the largest irrigation system in the world by 70%. That was ambition. But you know, what I, what I find very um, sad is that today, in today's India, you'll find so many who will abuse the man who went to jail for them, who fought for this country's freedom, who was one of the finest leaders of his time, and who worked very hard for the country and became its first prime minister. And by the way, fought for the kinds of freedoms that allow us to abuse him. So, but you know, uh, uh, speaking strictly from an economic per perspective, these guys, those days, not just Pandit Nehru, I mean, they were titans, I mean, all of them, there was a big team out there. These guys were doing amazing things, and they were facing incredible challenges. Nothing like what Mr. Vajpayee or Dr. Manmohan Singh or uh, Mr. Modi faced. They were much more severe things. And I think that's why, you know, it's important to, you know, go back and learn from our history and see what was going on. I, I think a valid point, and I'm just going to recommend that please uh, grab his book because uh, if you want to look at data and economic policy and facts as they are, and, you know, to Salman's credit, I mean, I'm possibly not capable of doing it as apolitically as he has done. It's a, it's a wonderful book. By the time you finish it, you won't even know that it's written by uh, not just a very brilliant guy in economics, but somebody who's part of the Congress party. My question to you, Salman, will be that isn't it an odd situation today that the man who became prime minister, talking of Vikas, which I believe not many children have been named Vikas who were born after 2014. That's what I read. Uh, is now apparently asking people, I was told as we walked in into the bookshop, that Mr. Modi in an interview has said, please vote for me because I want you to vote for the defense services. Is that right? Am I right? Actually, I think he said it at a rally today. Basically yeah. that, uh, no, he didn't say vote for me. He just said vote for the, de you know, basically something to the... Well, that's what it means. Vote from the armed forces. But vote. that's what it means. Well, yeah, yeah, of course. Vote for the martyrs. Vote for the, vote for the martyrs. martyrs. Yeah. So... And the CRPF guys who died. I think, uh, uh, frankly, I mean, uh, this is something where the election commission... It's unprecedented. It is. Uh, I mean, but, you know, every, every day it seems like we hit a new low. And, you know, obviously we're talking, for, mo for the most part, I know a lot of AIPC fellows out here. So I think in some ways we're talking to our own uh, colleagues. But at the same time, uh, this, is, uh, this is clearly unacceptable. I mean, there are so many things that are unacceptable. Uh, uh, but this in particular, in fact... If I, if I uh, remember, you know, I, I think I recall uh, that uh, Mrs. Gandhi was uh, disqualified by the Allahabad High Court, I think. Uh, because uh, of the height of the rostrum. And, and that government workers had uh, somehow uh, contributed yeah. to building uh, some yeah. sort of a stage for her. Yeah. That is why she was disqualified. Today, the Prime Minister says so many things which are simply, should not be acceptable to 21st century India. Should not be acceptable to say that uh, uh, Rahul Gandhi is contesting from Vainad because uh, minorities dominate that uh, Lok Sabha constituency. Because what you're saying is basically the minorities who, uh, their votes are somehow tainted. That should not be acceptable. That is where the election commission should come in and say, this is not right, Mr. Prime Minister, this is your final warning. And today, 
he should be disqualified. That's what I really. And by the way, I, I know I'm going, getting away from the main. No, topic no, 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 no. But I, I think I'll tell you why. I, the reason why I'm, I'm actually making this discussion a little contemporary is because I think we need to understand that because you know the, the economics is not divorced from the politics. Now, and the question is that you have a prime minister who is brazenly, publicly making a statement using religion. And by the way, let me tell you a very good example given by Salman. Mrs. Gandhi was disqualified because her election agent had not technically, it's not that he had not technically resigned from his government job before he became her agent, her polling agent. Okay. And uh, that was a technical thing. He had already resigned. They had not accepted it. And that's the reason why she was, she was removed as an MP. It led to a, a major political crisis in India. Here you have a prime minister playing religious politics, ladies and gentlemen. And therefore, I'm going to ask you the question. You said very sweetly that election commission should. So my question links back to that. Is, are the institutions dead today? Or let's be honest, is the election commission now become a toothless paper tiger? <laughs> well, you know, I, 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 I think that um, it is certainly not Mr. T. N. Sessions' election commission. So it's not even Mr. Qureshi's election commission. I think it's a different election. Let's be honest, it is Mr. Modi's election commission. <laughs> it, is, it is perhaps Mr. Modi's election commission. But, you know, these things, uh, frankly, I, 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 again, taking an economic lens at all of this, uh, one thing that uh, we've learned around the world uh, uh, is that you cannot really be strong in economic terms if you have social strife. Unless, unless places have social cohesion, um, it's very hard to uh, uh, grow in a good way. Uh, and, and I think uh, India is in danger uh, of uh, if there is no correction. And by the way, I think these are the, these are the kinds of uh, things that take a long time to heal. Social fissures take a long time to heal. I'm afraid that uh, 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 let me just put it this way. If, say today, we all gather and everybody, including Prime Minister Modi uh, and Mr. Rahul Gandhi, everybody says, okay, we're not going to get divisive anymore. We're all going to be together. Everybody says it. I think it's still going to take about a generation. If, if Mr. Modi and Mr. Gandhi together say that we will not, we'll all be together, India cannot be divided, we should not have polarization. If they all come together, I think it's still going to take a generation to uh, uh, fix some of the things that have happened in the country. And by the way, that is going to have an economic impact. There is no question about it. That's what evidence from around the world tells us. Okay, I'm going to, I'm going to come back to one point in your book. And uh, that's about, you know, you mentioned that during the time of the UPA time, you had this strange contradiction of both acquisitions of crony capitalism and welfareism, which means that while big business prospered, uh, there was also a lot of expenditure done for the poor and for the underprivileged and for the Dalits and the minorities, etc. A dichotomy of sorts. Um, isn't it strange, but actually if you look at the current government of Mr. Modi, it's really a perfect example of crony capitalism. All the airports have gone to Gautam Adani in record time. Uh, we all know the famous money in the Rafael scam, uh, which is a brazen violation of defense procedures. And Mr. Modi has actually been promoting Manrega, a scheme that he mocked at. So uh, isn't it strange, but the BGP has actually tried to follow the Congress, but with disastrous results. Actually, there's some very interesting uh, data that I can share with you, uh, which uh, some of you already probably know. Uh, Let's take the stock market. The stock market uh, grew fastest under UPA1, yeah. second fastest under UPA2, third fastest under uh, Prime Minister Modi, and fourth fastest under Mr. Vajpayee. Strange. Stock market growth has been phenomenal under Dr. Manmohan Singh. At the same time, social sector spending started picking up under UPA, and the Prime Minister, despite his you know, talk denigrating Manrega, uh, they really pushed it. But interestingly, the other thing we see is, you know, let's take a middle class taxpayer. Middle class taxpayers 
are actually paying a higher ratio of tax collections than those who are at the upper end of the spectrum. So corporations uh, are paying less as a, you know, uh, as a share of total tax collections. And regular taxpayers are paying more. Income tax for individuals is a, a bigger share now. Indirect taxes, like GST and all these, are now a much higher share of uh, the total tax compared to income taxes or corporate income taxes. That basically means it's regressive because everybody pays uh, indirect taxes, even the poor pay indirect taxes. Then, if you look at the companies that pay taxes, effective tax rate for companies that are at the upper end, which have profits of hundreds of crores, their effective tax rates are around 23%, roughly. And the ones who are making 0 to 1 or 0 to 2 crores profits are taxed at about, effectively at about 28 to 29%. It's, it's a totally kind of weird system that we've gotten into. Also, inequality because of lack of job creation, which, by the way, was a feature even in, under UPA. We weren't really creating a lot of jobs. Under, the, uh, under Prime Minister Modi, it's become worse. Inequality, obviously, will rise because if you don't have job creation, inequality is going to rise. My fear is that we are going, heading in the direction of Russia. So the Russian model is that uh, uh, the establishment gets together with some big, really big, I mean, I'm talking about, talking about you know, big oligarchs. And they then control uh, levers of government. I fear that India may be headed in a similar direction. It is. I mean, I mean, how can we deny? I mean, there is no denying. You open up the papers and you'll find out that this is a government. I mean, there's a linking back again to politics here. You have a BJP that has electoral bonds. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't know if you've heard of it. To fund a political party, this government has created what is called as an electoral bond. So today, if you are a corporate or you are a high net worth individual, and you donate to the Congress or to the BJP or a third party, your name will be kept discreet. Nobody will disclose your name. The government will know, your banker won't know, your shareholders won't know, you are secret. Now tell me, isn't that the most convenient way for, well, fixing deals, quid pro quos? And therefore I'm coming back to that point, Salman, that on crony capitalism, this government has legalized it, which is what Dr. Manmohan Singh said. And I'm linking back to the one question without which I don't think any discussion of this government will be over. Demonetization. You know, I mean, I met somebody in my office and I said, how are you feeling? And if he wasn't feeling good earlier, he used to say something else. Now he says, I'm just feeling demonetized. Uh, so I'm going to ask you this question. Demonetization, Salman, what's your take? Mr. Dr. Manmohan Singh called it organized loot and legalized plunder. What's yours? A plunder? I, I think uh, demonetization was just a very thoughtless uh, kind of thing. I think it's, you know, it's probably somebody went to the Prime Minister said that, you know, we can get rid of black money like this, uh, it'll have all these repercussions and you will become, uh, you know, the, one of the greatest Indians ever. And I think that I, uh, he clearly did not consult um, serious economists. I'm pretty sure even somebody who's done a bachelor's in economics could have kind of, uh, you, know, uh, you know, said, look, sir, this is not the right way to go. I think, uh, I think it was a monu monumental kind of uh, mistake. Uh, because, you see, when you have a country that uh, relies heavily on cash, and you have, on top of that, See, Japan also relies heavily on cash. Germany also relies heavily on cash. But their, their formal sectors are much bigger. So we are cash dependent, and our informal sector is vast. About 80 to 90% of your workers come, work in the informal sector. So we're a double whammy. And then you do note bandi, and that, uh, you know, that is just uh, an unconscionable decision. I, in fact, I, I, in this book, I kind of talk about a Twitter exchange with uh, uh, a Modi supporting uh, economist at that time, Vivek Deheja, who is no longer as happy about Mr. Modi's performance. And he said that, you know, uh, this, uh, uh, this is going to bear fruit over time. The money is going to come back. So, uh, some of it will not come back and, you know, we'll be better off and all the stuff. There's going to be more formalization. 
And I kind of said, Vivek, I don't think that's going to happen. We're going to have a short term, uh, certainly a short term uh, problem, at least for the next two, three uh, quarters. But even I was wrong. Actually, I was also wrong. Yep. Yep. Because as I note in this book, uh, I think demonetization impacts are still uh, uh, revealing themselves. Uh, and uh, IMF research you know, for on okay, cross-country uh, research, 190 or some countries involved, involved, they talk about exogenous as in shocks that are from outside and you basically shock the economy. And if the economy is growing like this or like this, if you can see it this way, and then there's a shock, it goes down, and then people think that it's going to go back to the old trend. The only difference is that when you go like this, you come down, you may go back up, but not all the way back to the original trajectory, and you lose some of your output. And the reason is, if you are, say, a small business or a micro enterprise, you, sh you, get, you get shut down because of something like demonetization. After three, four months, it's not like you can pick up and say, I'm going to start my business again. Some of them are permanent, permanently out of business. That's why you read stories about job losses. If you remember the Center for Monitoring of, uh, Indian, of the Indian Economy, CMIE, uh, keeps writing about uh, stuff, uh, you know, how uh, small manufacturers have lost out, micro enterprises have been shut down, job losses have happened. It is because of that. Yeah, this. yeah, yeah. So and, 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 and ladies and gentlemen, I don't know whether you're aware, but there's more cash in the system today than there was before demonetization. And, you know, do you think that somewhere uh, the real objective was really obliteration of black money? Because as the scandal grew, uh, you know, Arun Shuri, who was a former finance minister of the BJP under Mr. Bajpai, he called it the biggest money laundering scam, which means many people were tipped off that ye hone wala hai, who converted their black money to white, which is why the banking system had no black money because they had been converted already. It's a big scam, and I think, you know, there is a lot of statements uh, that tell us that this will have to be probed by a new government. Yeah, you know, I think, I think it requires a probe, and obviously lots of lives have been destroyed. Yeah. But in my opinion, you know, I, I, I think from when I, when I, and I write about this in the book, I think uh, a bigger mistake, there was a bigger mistake made by the Modi government that doesn't get as much attention, and it should, and that is... GST. No. That is the banking sector. The government... NPS. You know, the, 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 the government, we had a problem of non-performing assets... Uh, in the country, well, you know, before Prime Minister Modi came, it started under the UPA, no doubt about it, but it was still relatively small, and lots of people had been, the IMF, the World Bank, the government's own Department of Economic Affairs had been kind of highlighting this issue, that there is a problem of non-performing uh, assets, and we've got to fix this now. And the trouble with non-performing assets is that if you don't fix them early enough, they can grow bigger. See, the banking sector is like the lifeblood of an economy. If, if uh, non-performing assets basically start growing, your blood supply chokes up and you get a heart attack. That's what the economy got. Even though people don't seem to realize it, the economy got a heart attack because of uh, this choked up banking sector. Now, my argument is that Mr. Jetty and Mr. Modi, they were focusing on all the wrong issues at that time. They, were, they went after the Land Act, which had not been notified, which was notified in January of 2014. They should have gone for after the banking sector. The prime minister at that time could have said, this is the problem I inherited. It is not my fault. I'm going to fix it. I need public money to do this. I think people would have forgiven him for that. But I think they said to themselves, this is going to resolve itself. And again, experience around the world says that these things do not resolve themselves. I think that was an error of um, uh, uh, omission. And I think that is what has caused the economy to continue. In fact, before demonetization, the economy was actually slowing down uh, several quarters before demonetization. And the reason was this. And demonetization is like harakiri. Right? You kill yourself. Come. Abel Mujemar. But the banking sector was a very serious, serious error in my view. They waited uh, quite a long time to do it. Uh, and many, I mean, you know, if you talk to economists, I mean, they'll, they'll say, yeah, because, you know, this, this is not very popular. No, uh, but, 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 but let's realize... And an, GST, by God. Yeah, G, I mean, GST, a brilliant, by the way, law. Um, the entire architecture of the GST was prepared by the Congress Party 
and the UPA, not passed by Narendra Modi and Shivraj Chauhan, because they did not want the UPA to get credit for it. Now, because Mr. Modi wanted a lot of drama, it is the best thing to have happened after 1947. And so he had that midnight, you know, he's, I have a feeling he has a massive inferiority complex where Jawaharlal Nehru is concerned. So, you know, midnight's tryst with destiny, so he had to do something at the midnight, unprepared, totally done in an amateurish way. GST became a problem for small traders. It actually, frankly speaking, hurt your GDP. And many of them got wiped out. So it's a combination of GST execution, not the GST law per se, plus the terrible demonetization, which is voodoo economics. I think it was suggested by him, by some RSS guy who must have woken up from the wrong side of the bed and you know, had some utopian dream of Hindu Rashtra and said, ye kar do yaar, so kar do. So you tell me, I mean, does India, no, no, one minute, let me ask you this question. If you were right now to say this very dispassionately to an audience that we don't know who they want to vote for tomorrow, would you recommend that this government on economic policy to anybody in your life? No, I, I'm sorry, I can't, no, there's no way because, uh, the, you know, obviously, uh, uh, I, I, and this is not because I'm, with the, uh, I'm a member of the Congress or something, it, they've just... Uh, uh, no, no I, I'll give you full credit, he's one of the most neutral and very dispassionate people when it comes to policy. Go ahead, please. This is a very, uh, you know, I have a very uh, short, uh, basic story on uh, what has happened to the economy under, uh, in these five years. Basically, the government came, obviously a lot of expectations. It was a slightly recovering economy and then oil prices fell. There was a great, great opportunity. Instead of a land fight, go with the banking sector, fix the banking sector, start fixing the banking sector. But you have two terrible monsoons. So you don't fix the banking sector. You have two terrible monsoons in 2014 and 15. Nobody can blame uh, Prime Minister Modi for that. God's gift to us. 2016, things start recovering for farmers. They do demonetization. And then GST, a double whammy. When, when people are start, starting to kind of find their feet, GST comes in. And it's like this GST, when it was first implemented after, after, after you know, they've come up with lots of changes after that. Is one of the worst ways you could do indirect taxation. Worst ways. Why? Multiple slabs, which have cascading impacts, high tax rates. And what are people doing now? They're actually trying to circumvent the system. So many returns. At one point, people had to uh, put in what? 33 returns a year? Per, yeah, something yeah. And like per, that. Per Some state. Crazy. And per state, yeah. So, I would say this is the story, not attending to, the, uh, to, uh, to uh, the balance sheets of the banks, not trying to figure out how to fix the corporate balance sheets, because this was called the twin balance sheet problem, which by the way, everybody had been talking about. Mon two mo failed monsoons, they start coming, you know, recovering, and then demonetization, then GST. And, okay, uh, so and a lot of, and, uh, an incessant and extra focus on, you know, marketing. Yeah, yeah, everything. That kind of, yeah. You know, so, so I'm going to ask you a question. Hubris. I'm going to ask you a question. NPAs were around 2.3 lakh crores when it was inherited by the NDA. We are ri right now at around 11 lakh crores. And, 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 you know, this government gives lectures on corruption. I mean, it's got to be a joke. So I'm going to ask you a question. Out of 10, how much would you give this government on economic policy? You know, it's, it's hard to kind of rate, but you know, uh, uh, by the way, just to kind of uh, note, uh, they did... Okay, why, why do you think of the answer? I'll give it 1.5 on 10. <laughs> the, they, they did manage to bring in, uh, uh, you know, the bankruptcy code, which is ultimately may or may not work, but at least uh, that, was, uh, that was done. I think that was, uh, that was a positive move. I think uh, the focus on Manrega uh, and letting people uh, uh, benefit from that, that helped, by the way. If there were no Manrega, after demonetization, this country would be in deep, deep trouble. Yeah. Much more trouble than we are in. So thank God for Manrega. No wonder, the, by the way, the World Bank called it uh, a stellar example of uh, uh, social, social security, social, yeah. social uh, protection, or something to that effect. <laughs> well before Prime Minister Modi became the Prime Minister. So, uh, but but again, when I write a book which says it is a great disappointment, you can't really give it uh, uh, many you know, high marks. Uh, and again, uh, I don't know. 
no matter what happens in this election, uh, you know, clearly I feel that um, uh, Mr. Modi has lost that opportunity. And he has no one to blame but himself. Yep. I, by the way, Yashwan Sena, in fact, I've had a long conversation with him, wrote a book where he said the last five years, he called it as the wasted half decade. Uh, you inherited a growing economy from the UPA and, and I think blew it up completely. So I'm going to ask you one more question before we uh, throw it open to the House. Uh, rather, two more. Everybody knows that jobs is a big issue for this election. 45 year high, I'm not even going to give you the data. PhDs and engineers and MBAs and uh, brilliant scientists are applying for the job of PNs and constables. I'm not saying the job of a PN and constable is not important, but if a prime minister is saying, Aap pakode fry karo, then you have a problem. And don't forget the other part of rural distress, farmers committing suicide. I don't know how many of you know, this government has stopped publishing data on employment is stop publishing data on farmer suicides. The, the brilliant statisticians of this country have resigned because the government has said, I don't want to publish the data. So the big question, Salman, because you and I deal with numbers all the time, you think the biggest damage to India has been the credibility of Indian government data is now totally questioned. Nobody believes what you say. Nobody believes India's GDP. Nobody believes India's employment. Nobody buys your data on farmer employment. It's going to be a tough one. Okay, so this is uh, what people uh, should pay much more attention to. You know, I know data can be boring and all that, but uh, data is very, very important. National statistics are extremely important. When I was at the World Bank, uh, we, we would constantly kind of, uh, you know, uh, make fun of Chinese data because we knew that they were manipulating data. Uh, so people in the bank, it's an open secret in the World Bank and the IMF that uh, Chinese data was not exactly <laughs> what it was made out, of, made, it, uh, made out to be. And, uh, but Indian data was always kind of, you know, the, uh, respected. Uh, I'd never in my World Bank career uh, heard uh, that, oh, uh, the data that's coming, national income data that's coming from the Central Statistical Office was something that they didn't believe in. But unfortunately, and I've written about this, um, uh, when the revision of uh, economic data happened starting 2015, and uh, we kept asking uh, for what we call the back series. Okay, if this is a new method, and by the way, you do have to revise economic data because uh, these days you have iPhones or smartphones. Remember the times when there were no mobile phones at all. So you can't really, you have to keep updating information. But at the same time, you also have to then apply models to kind of uh, give back data so that you can have a comparison. So we didn't have it for three years. In fact, the Americans do this routinely, and the Chinese as well, and they backdate it all the way, you know, they can go back to the uh, 1910s, 1920s. So uh, uh, the government here did it until uh, 2012. And uh, they kept revising it, and then, of course, they'd set up a commission uh, through the National Statistical Commission. There was a committee that came out and basically ended up saying that uh, UPA growth was actually higher than what, what uh, had been indicated, uh, what had been, uh, you know, the case using the old series. And, of course, the government clamped down on that report, and then they came up, then the Niti Ayo quickly uh, uh, came up with some new information. So this is an example, you know, one example I'll share with you, which kind of tells you how ridiculous things are and why people don't believe this data anymore. And that is, one day before the interim budget was presented, the GDP data was revised one more time. And according to that new data, the Indian economy grew faster in the year of demonetization than in any other year under Mr. Modi. It's like this government could wake up and suddenly tell you, yaar, abhi aat nahi baje, abhi to and everybody says, Haan, sare no At least somebody in a TV channel called Republic will say, Yeah, sare no ni, das baj rahe. But, but, but remember. I, I mean, you're becoming a joke. Let's be honest. It's a very serious issue. No, but, you, you know, honestly, if people are now looking at Indian data with skepticism, like they look at China, I can promise you, ladies and gentlemen, this is not a laughing matter. You know, that to, to restore the credibility of government data in the international markets is a gargantuan task. This is not an easy one. You want to say but, something? No, just, just uh, you know, imagine when you're revising up by 1.2 percentage points, not 1.2 percent, 1.2 percentage points. That's a much bigger <laughs> number than 1.2 percent. You're actually, yeah. in, you know, your GDP gets inflated. 
when you do the fiscal deficit, you do it as a ratio of GDP. So suddenly you say, oh, by the way, our fiscal deficit ratio is 3.3%. Yeah. We met our target. That's insane. But, you know, that's what's happened. You know, and, and there's not enough room to ask. You know, we can ask these questions, but the media doesn't really carry it. But don't think that international investors are stupid. Yeah. They're not going to no, they're not, they're not. Just, you know. they're not. They're watching. They're watching. And I, I want to ask you this question. I mean, since you mentioned media and my one question after that, and ladies and gentlemen, then it's over to you. How culpable do you think is mainstream media of India, particularly television, for creating this whole manufactured parallel universe where none of us know what is really going on because you're just told this is it, take it or lump it. And you and I go as part of TV debates and we know that barring a few, the rest of them are all set up. Um, yeah, I, I think, you know, the media is extremely important, obviously, you know, uh, and, and unfortunately this happens in pretty much every country where there's a strong man that emerges. And uh, then over time, institutions start buckling and media is one of the first to kind of be taken over because they're the ones who propagate the message. And in India, unfortunately, uh, uh, you know, things, you know, the last sections of the media are compromised, especially at the national level. But at the same time, there are lots of, uh, you know, now smaller players that come up and so they're trying to fight back. But in no, fact, it's the online people who are, in fact, doing a brilliant job. In fact, it's the online, I don't know how many of you follow the wires and the scrolls and the quints and, you know, Jantaka reporter. Uh, there, 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 there are people who are fighting back, but uh, unfortunately, television, especially, you know, Hindi uh, television is big. And uh, let's just say that uh, sometimes reporters and t television anchors become, uh, it's almost like they're they're workers of the BJP. Yeah. Uh, and that is, uh, that is uh, dispiriting to some extent, but actually for people like me, that actually gives me even more motivation to keep fighting. So, uh, uh, so you know, obviously, I may have written the book to be as, uh, as uh, kind of uh, uh, objective as I possibly could, uh, but I know where my convictions are, and I think um, uh, as soon as I leave this room, I'm going to transform again into a political worker, and I'm going to keep fighting. Oh, I, th I think you got, a, you got a back on the right side. So one question for you. I'm sure a lot of people would be keen to know. The Congress party has made a big bet on Nyai. Uh, Nyai is about paying the bottom people at the bottom of the pyramid 20% uh, to get a fixed 72,000 rupees per year, uh, which takes them to almost 1,44,000 a year. Uh, as an economist, and now don't wear the political hat, uh, the BJP says, ye paise kahan se aayenge? Uh, I don't know what that means because they, they just announced in their yesterday's manifesto 100 lakh crores. The NAI has 3 lakh crores, 3.6 lakh crores. Yesterday in the BJP manifesto, they have announced 100 lakh crores for infrastructure, 25 lakh crores for agriculture. Huh. So I don't know 100 lakh and 25 lakh where they're coming from is not, not a problem. But Congress 3 lakh crores is a very serious masla. So, you will give the answer to that. You know, I will, I will say this. Uh, uh, it's an obvious question for many people, especially in our room, uh, you know, oh, will we be taxed and uh, why, are we, why is the Congress party talking about, uh, why, why are we always doling out money and all this stuff? But one thing you should keep in mind is, uh, in 2016, the Asian Development Bank prepared a report on social protection, which is extremely important for any country and basically rated India 24th out of 35 Asian countries in terms of spending on social protection as a share of its economy. We're behind places like Nepal, Pakistan. So we're not spending enough on this country's poor people. That's a, that's a fact, okay? Regardless of what people say, that is a fact. We need to do more because we have a lot of destitution in some ways in this country. So how does one pay for it? Uh, so uh, the, the, the argument is 3,50,000 crores is 2% of GDP, and of course it's not 2%, it's actually 1.8% right now. And then we're not planning to roll it out in one go because that, would be, that, can have, that can have different consequences. But as a matter of policy, what we should be doing is we should be testing schemes first, piloting them. That's what we did with Manrega. And then we rolled it out in phases. What that does is this 3,50,000 crores progressively becomes a smaller share of your economy. So instead of becoming, say, 1.8% of GDP right now, our estimate is that at its peak, 
which, which could, uh, we could hit in three or four years, it would be 1.2 to 1.5% of GDP. And then progressively go down because the economy is going to keep growing. And uh, this will remain at 3,50,000 crores. And the other thing to keep in mind is that when you give poor people money for their survival, because they're basically living on the margins, they don't save, they spend. So when you spend, actually the consumption uh, growth in this country is suffering right now. If you look at today's newspapers, auto sales are down, auto sales are down, um, uh, vehicle sales are down, uh, uh, rural demand is kind of, uh, you know, uh, stuck. So this comes as a fiscal stimulus. This comes as a stimulus to the economy. Imagine all the poor people going and buying soap or a toothpaste or toothbrush and, uh, or spending on education of their children. That feeds into the formal economy. And that actually helps grow the economy as well. So there's a fiscal uh, stimulus. So uh, uh, the Congress president has said very clearly that uh, we have to be careful about uh, uh, you know, managing our fiscal deficit. The reason for that is very simple. If you have high fiscal deficits and inflation, that's a tax, especially on poor people. So if we're trying to help people, we cannot also hurt them. So we have to, uh, but I think if we do it in a phased manner, I don't, think, I don't think there's a problem. And by the way, it should be morally unacceptable to us that there are people in this country who are being left behind progressively because there are no jobs, yeah. they don't have a future. How can we let that be? How can India become, a, uh, become an economic power or an economic superpower if we leave so many people behind? Yeah. It is morally unacceptable. Yeah. It is unacceptable to me as a human being that we leave so many uh, 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 of our fellow countrymen and women behind. Oh, we're not going to do that. I think that's a cause worth fighting for. Please don't worry about you know, the fear mongering and all that. That's what they said about Manrega, and Manrega has done pretty well for this yeah, country. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And I'll give you one example, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I don't know how many of you know, but in Delhi, last year, if I'm not mistaken, it was last year, there was a family in which three girls aged eight, four, and two. Just imagine three siblings in Delhi. in Delhi, in Delhi, right under the Prime Minister's nose, eight, four, and two years old, they died of starvation. The mother actually went to the police because she didn't have enough, it was reported to the police, and she was fainting as she talked. The three children, aged eight, four, and two, had not eaten in eight days. And I think that's the point that Salman's making, and, and that's why I think Nayak could exactly what India needs. How can we sit here in this lovely, beautiful bookstore, and you know, maybe some of us will drive down to the Taj Hotel, and others will maybe go to Starbucks, and you know, all of us will go to our homes and watch our TVs. But you know, at the end of the day, in India, where people are dying of starvation, is not the story we want it to be. So hopefully now will make that big difference. Ladies and gentlemen, a big hand to Salman for this uh, uh, wonderful, uh, and, uh, and you know, the whole, the whole idea was to kind of try and take his book. He's written a wonderful last chapter on what he believes is got to be the future. Very well thought through. You can see the mind of a person who cares. It's an intellectually very powerful message. I loved it, Salman, honestly, very well stated, but right now, the floor is open to you for a few questions. Let's start with you, sir. Yeah. Come on. It's working? Yeah. Uh, so congratulations on the book. Uh, you know, my question is very simple. Uh, do you think all this uh, economics is going to translate into politics? Which basically means, to put it very, very simply, how many seats do you think the Congress is going to win? That is not a very simple question. Uh, I, I, think, I think that uh, in this election, um, the economy is going to play a big part. In fact, my, my view is that uh, had the economy done uh, uh, reasonably okay, even moderately okay, uh, and created you know, just some semblance of jobs, maybe re the, uh, the farmer's distress was a little less and all that, Mr. Modi would, uh, I would say Mr. Modi would uh, uh, go get home easily, but, uh, but I don't think that's the case. I think uh, the fact that uh, the Prime Minister today uh, essentially asked people to vote for the country's armed forces who are supposed to be kept out of the political fray, uh, asking, uh, armed, uh, asking people to vote for uh, the martyrs of uh, Pulwama tells me that there's something uh, that they are seeing internally 
uh, which we're also seeing, uh, that the ride is not as easy as we had thought or I had thought on May 16, 2014. Um, this is very much a very, very, uh, it's a tough election. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's going to be, in my view, just a couple of percentage points here and there in constituencies, and that can shift the balance. Uh, one thing I will tell you, that uh, uh, in the last election, uh, the Congress got 44, and the UPA got 59 seats. Right now, my estimate is that in the states of Kerala, Karnataka, and uh, Tamil Nadu, the UPA is going to touch roughly 59 seats. So we're far away from 2014. And frankly, the reason the opposition has a shot is because of what has happened to the economy. I think that's, that's very well stated. And uh, let me tell you, the very fact that the manifesto barely talks about and you know economy tells you that they have actually realized there have been a disaster. So, and whatever else Bill Clinton may have done, his big contribution is saying it's always the economy is stupid. So I guess that's, that's what we've got to keep in mind. Yeah, no, no, I, 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 we will, I, just before we come to you, we'll take the question of the gentleman at the back and I'll come to you after that, yeah. Can, can you give him a mic, please, so that everybody can hear quickly, quickly, quickly. You can point out the people. Yeah, I'll do that, I'll do that. I will really, I will come to you after that, yeah. Just put up your hands and we'll take as many questions. Yeah, okay. I just want to know whether your book, Teams TV, Happiness Index, because in 2014, when Modi inherited his government, it was 117. Now it is 140. That means the Happiness Index has substantially yeah, yeah. gradually yeah. came down. Yeah. So have you dealt this in <laughs> You, you know, um, it's a good point. It's a good point. Yeah. The, the, the problem with those of us who have learned at the World Bank is that uh, you know we we try to focus more on uh, regular macro data and uh, not on other indices. I uh, but at the same time that is our weakness. Uh, for example, uh, I feel that we should be paying a lot more attention to the UNDP's uh, Human Development uh, Index because I think that that is a very kind of uh, uh, yeah. That broader, uh, you know, because uh, GDP per se does not say enough. Yeah. You know, it, it uh, it's not sufficient. I think HDI, the happiness index is another way to look at it. And of course, as you say, um, uh, and you're correct, uh, India's rankings have fallen. Uh, but you know, uh, overall, I would say that if if the economy is not doing well. Uh, that, uh, that it does have an impact on happiness. And I think that may be some correlation there. I, I, and, and I can tell you, it's also got to do with all these lynchings, yeah. the attacks on the Dalits and the minorities, yeah. the fear that if you criticize Modi, you'll have a defamation notice on an FIR, or they're going to come and threaten you. Uh, the fact that corporates in India are scared, they may have an income tax rate. I can tell you from my own experience, Salman, and I'll share it with the audience. Uh, I meet a lot of people who are CEOs in Mumbai. And I asked them, you know, would you like to fund the Congress party? They were like, no, we don't want to do that. We love you. We'll vote for you. But if I fund you, I know the somebody from Delhi is going to move the phones and we'll have a tax rate on us. So the unhappiness index is rising for India. I think that's a matter of concern. Do you have your question? Hi, Salman. Uh, if we're going to win, if Congress is going to be com coming into power, what are the challenges that we're going to face economically? Okay. This is going to be a very difficult uh, thing for the next government. I mean, the economy is frankly not in uh, good shape. And there are short-term problems, but then there are some serious long-term challenges. I mean, the short-term problems are, you know, related to investment. I mean, our investments are just not picking up. Our exports are down. Shekhar Gupta, you know, I mean, you know Shekhar Gupta, he tweeted today something to the effect that um, under uh, uh, the UPA, exports grew by 150% or something, and under the Modi government, about 10%. After, after. So we have some uh, short-term problems. But unfortunately, the bigger problem that I see is uh, on uh, employment. Uh, because that's, uh, I, I call it in the book, I call it an overarching kind of problem. And the reason for that is the following. One, our education system is not producing uh, uh, the kind of uh, 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 young people who could actually take on positions that f future industries are going to need. On the other hand, our current stock, we have a stock problem, right? We, we, we have the stock of young people who have a certificate in their hands, 
and they say, give me a job. So there's a reason that about 2.5 crore uh, young people applied for 63,000 class two, I think they call it class two jobs in the railways. Imagine 25, uh, 2.5 crore for 63,000 or so jobs. Uh, so, so we have a stock problem. And then I see artificial intelligence, I see uh, you know, machine learning, Drones advances of whatever. technology. Now, that doesn't mean that uh, there'll be no new jobs created. It's just that there'll be new types of jobs. The problem is that our people are not ready for that world. And we're not investing enough in human development. We do not, we're not, if you do not invest in human capital, which is health and education, Say goodbye to all of your dreams of being like this uh, super economic superpower. Yeah, yeah I, I, oh, it's, it's going to be yeah, the biggest, yeah. biggest challenge for any government that comes in. That's a long-term challenge. But in order for you to bridge the this divide from the short from now to the long term, you have to do a lot of stuff in the interim. And I, I, I personally feel that if we do not, uh, and Amartya Sen is absolutely right in that, and I quote him in this: If you do not, spa, uh, you know, if you do not invest properly, properly in health and education. By the way, if you have, we still have 30, 40 percent uh, of our children are stunted. When you have malnutrition in this country, imagine what happens to the brain. Brain function is affected. When you go to class, you don't learn as well. When you grow older, you're not as productive. And I have data in this uh, book as well on that. So you need to work at, you need to come at this problem, not just for, from education side, but also from the health side, nutrition side. And then only can you start having an impact. So it's a, no matter what comes in, it's in trouble. Okay, I'm just going to request uh, everybody to keep the questions brief. And Salman, you two, just kind of a quick, shorter answers in the interest of time. Uh, uh, just by the way, uh, education budget uh, by, the U by the Congress is a commitment to double it. And on health, over five years, and including on health. So you're going to see education at 6%. I think that that's a whole whole ambition. He's made the point. Without it, you can't really grow. Your question, yeah. and then I the mic to mic to people at the yeah. back. Please. As Sanjay pointed out, uh, the electoral bonds, um, BJP has legitimized like non-transparent funding, but uh, and they've got 10 billion out of it in the last mm, four five mm, years. Mm. And Congress, uh, although we've been criticizing it, it's the second largest beneficiary with two billion. Uh, rupees, like mm. less right? than five so, percent. Yeah. Yeah. So, how do you? What is the party's position on electoral bonds, and what are you going to do about them? A good question. Okay. Yeah. Uh, 2017, 18, uh, 215 crores were uh, deposited uh, uh, with the SBI uh, for two, pol uh, basically for two political parties. The BJP got 210 crores. The BJP uh, Congress got five crores, and um, uh, nobody really knows who's paid except for SBI and the government. Uh, of course. The BJP knows who paid uh, what. Uh, the Congress Party's position is that electoral bonds will be abolished, and uh, uh, because uh, it's uh, clearly it's legalized uh, corruption, I would like the party to go one step further and say that every penny, every rupee, should be disclosed. Who paid? Even if it's five rupees, it should be disclosed. That's my my suggestion to my party. But I think electoral bonds are indeed uh, a conduit for creating the kind of oligarchy that I really, really worry about. Yeah, absolutely. And as, as he mentioned, in the Congress manifesto, we will abolish the electoral bond scheme. Yeah. Maybe investigate the money. And I think investigate the source of money that has gone into some political parties. Yeah. 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 Retrospectively. Yeah. Despite the great disappointments in the last uh, five uh, years, there's the public perception that the opposition has not been able to narrativize this uh, for these elections, that uh, this election will be fought on security, both external after Pulwama and after today's attack in Chhattisgarh, increasingly on internal uh, security. There's also the perception that the opposition has just done, not done enough to create a united front and that actually the Congress has undermined some of these alliance building activities uh, uh, by failing to join the Mahagathbandhan in UP, uh, the prevarication about Delhi. Uh, if you had time, would you have uh, looked at the strategy differently? Uh, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you this. Um, the reason people do not often hear about the Communist Party's or the opposition's narrative is because, like I said, vast sections of the media, including uh, you know, vernacular press, 
are basically right now uh, working for the BJP. And, and it is not because they love the BJP. It is either because there's money behind it or there is pressure, coercion behind it. So we, you know, I've seen some really, really important stories buried inside uh, uh, newspapers, uh, people not talking about them. You, you have, right now you have uh, income tax raids on opposition leaders. Not a single BJP leader has been targeted. And that is using government machinery during election time to target the opposition so that they cannot uh, uh, you know, conduct uh, 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 campaigning. So uh, it's easy to say that uh, uh, the opposition doesn't have a narrative, but the reality is that that narrative is never allowed to get to uh, the people. The second part uh, uh, is uh, that in the Mahagat Bandhan or other alliance problems that you see, I mean, the Congress Party has many alliances in many states. In some states, don't think that the Congress party is the hurdle. Some other parties can also be a hurdle. So, um, so that's where I'll leave it. And I think, you're, you're, you know, to answer your question, uh, I think all opposition parties have realized that there is a serious danger to democracy and to the Indian constitution. And, but the reality is, I'll give you one example of how coalition works. Uh, in, in the time when West Bengal and Kerala went for elections, assembly elections, the Congress party was in alliance with the CPM in West Bengal and we were contesting the CPM in Kerala. So these are the realities of our times. But I think end of day both parties have to negotiate and come to a settlement. Okay, what we'll do in the interest of time is take four or five questions. Faridun will take your question and after that we'll take four or five at one time and then Salman you'll answer them all. Faridun, your question? Yeah, thank you very much for the uh, wonderful question. Uh, so I have a couple of questions, one for, one for you Mr. Jai and one for Salman sir. Um, so, uh, you said that 2014 the problem was things were not marketed properly maybe by, by Congress. Uh, do you think in 2019 you guys have uh, successfully communicated to people uh, the problems uh, that, that were created by uh, the present government and the sort of vision that you guy, guys have for the country? And my question to you, Mr. Jai, is that you spoke about the election commission and the media. Um, you guys have, I think, the biggest carter in the country. Is there something that could be done like on the ground so that to just protest about it? Because Already there are problems in EVMs which are fil filtering in for the first <laughs> round. Okay, why don't you go first on that one? You take both. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you go. I, I mean, the first one is a tough one. On, on the, are we communicating it right? I, I, I think that uh, uh, we're, we're trying hard. Uh, frankly, we don't have the resources to match the BJP, but we have a lot of passionate people uh, working flat out. They're working flat out because they, they really believe in what they're doing. Uh, for example, Nyai, uh, you know, whenever people hear about Nyai, they, they say, oh, this is great. We want, to do, we want you to do this. But getting that message out to people requires a lot of resources, a lot of mobilization. So now, in fact, today, before I came here, I was talking to people in Delhi, like, get, get, get things moving. And, uh, you know, you know, everybody, there are a lot of uh, well-intentioned people trying to work hard. But I would say that uh, we could have done even better, but uh, with the resources we have, uh, I think we're just going flat out. Yeah, I, I think ultimately, you know, one of the big learnings we have is uh, you can buy all the money uh, you, know, you want. You can, with the money, you can buy all the media you want. With the media, you can buy maybe further, you know, billboards and you can buy social media. But end of day, you know, you can't buy a human being's conscience. Yeah, exactly. You know, this is a very different election. It's a very fact, different. yeah. And, you know, Faridun, to answer your question, I mean, we don't have as much resources as the BJP. Uh, we have no control on the mainstream media, which is hardly playing its job. So how do we get the message out? Right. Remember, we still won Madhya Pradesh, we still won Chhattisgarh, we still won Rajasthan. And the last time there were five assembly elections, the BJP got a zero, right? Despite Modi and all the carpet bombing. So the truth is, you have to do door-to-door. -door. You have to do, you know, small gatherings. You have to try and tell your friends, do informal yeah. get-togethers where I can speak to people. And the power of social media is powerful. And end of the day, I think it's all about hard work. So, you know, these, you know, when you find our leaders, you know, doing these yatras and doing these road shows, that's part of the game. And let me tell you, let me tell you, this is how this government will be defeated. This is how the government will be defeated. I, I have people who come and tell me, the more I see Modi's face all over, the more I'm convinced there's something wrong. So, you know, there is, there is these, these are the stories of our time. So, rest assured, money and resources we may not have, but what we have is a willpower and resolution, 
and we're going to fight it tooth and nail. And don't believe opinion polls. Do don't believe, not opinion. believe opinion polls. Today, by the way, was the last opinion poll. <laughs> After this, is straight away the exit poll on 19th of May. So I'm chilled. Yeah. Um, okay, we'll take what we will do in the yeah. interest of time is we will take just a th three more questions. And after that, Salman is here. He's signing his book. He's going to float around. He's going to take questions. I have a TV uh, show to go for. So we're just going to take three more questions. Salman will answer them, and then we are done. And then you can chat with him informally. One, two. OK, now we'll make it four. One, two. I promised you three. I, I think I think we be four and, and and Salman, you will also answer all the questions after this thing is over. All right. Okay. So, so keep your question brief, brief yeah, if yeah. you don't mind. So yeah. you're a Kashmiri, right? Mm -hmm. And now the Congress has a Kashmir policy, which now the BJP policy has been a total disaster. Yeah, what's your question? So my question is, what is the Congress going to be to policy to resolve the Kashmir issue? Okay, fine. We, we, we will answer that later. By the way, uh, that question will probably take five books uh, to be written. I mean, that, but, but then uh, I, think, I think maybe you can answer that off the thing. Yeah. Yeah. My question is on the inflation. Uh, whenever, whichever economist I know, and when, and when I speak to them. Louder, please, if you don't mind. They say currently because of in, under the Modi government, the inflations are very low. Mm. And this is the best economic times India has ever seen. Mm. Because prior to the old government, even during the Vajpayee government, the inflation mm. was extremely high. It was mm. on an average. Okay. So you're saying that inflation is low. Yeah. So okay. the real GDP as of today is much higher than the, in the post-independence era. So how you counter that claim? Okay. No, later. You, you take them all once. Inflation is one. You have to keep it at the back of your head. Uh, yeah. Uh, how do you plan? To take these Kashmiri pundits back to where they belong to, sir. Okay. okay. I have been uprooted from there and uh, I have been uprooted from there. Okay. And I am here. Okay. How do you plan to do that? Okay. Second question. Public sector unit, Air India, bleeded very badly. How do you plan to bring it back? To it? Okay. okay. All right. So, on inflation on Kashmir and, 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 and one on Kashmir. Here, 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 there, there's one here. No, no, the gentleman here. Here, here, in front, in front here. Yeah, in Kobe DJ. And then we will take one, one question there with you, yeah. yeah. Sanjay, I don't want to ask any questions which are hypothetical. Ki what will you do? First, you have to come to do anything. So, the biggest thing is that I think that the Congress is like the RCB. The year is going to win the match with no strategy, no marketing. You, will, you said, and it's a follow-up question to that you can't just wish and desire to win on an anti Modi sentiment mm -hmm. because that's not going to do the trick for you. Mm -hmm. Door to door campaigning is not going to do the trick for you because there is a lot of people to be covered and made to be aware or mm -hmm. made to be understood. Mm -hmm. So I have been a BJP supporter all throughout. Mm -hmm. And if you think that just because you create an anti Modi sentiment in me, mm -hmm. I'm going to vote for Congress mm -hmm. and that too with lack of communication, mm -hmm. you said. Ki that that's what we are trying to communicate. What are you trying to communicate? That's mm -hmm. also not clear. It seems that Congress is slipping all around and it expects a miracle just because somebody like Anti Modi will do the trick. Krishna Bhagwan nahi aajane wale hain. Hamein hi khud karna padega kuch. Okay. RCB mein okay. 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 No, no, fine, fine. Kuch nahi so I, I heard your question. I heard your question. Take it down. So his question is that uh, no no just a second sir. There's a gentleman at the back. There. No no at the back. Here boss if you don't mind. Yeah, give it, give, give it to him at the back. Yeah, please. So, yeah, no, I, I, yeah. No, no, here, here, to him, to him, to him. Hi, Salman. Yeah. Please go ahead. Loud, please, we can't hear you. My question is on IBC. Policies which uh, government had was rolling out IBC. Now there is economic stress and there is uh, you know financial stress. There's difference in that, right? A lot of companies were basically uh, taken at a right uh, amount, but now the, the, there is a lot of value destruction. So do you think IBC is actually working with this regime, or this is only those crony capitals who are like eyeing some very good assets in India are actually buying companies at peanuts? I mean that is what. My question is. Okay. Uh, that, okay. Now the rest of the questions we will take it. We'll take it offline. Do you have a question? 
Can you keep it short, please, yeah, if you don't I, mind? I, yeah. I'm short. I am Mohammad Wajiuddin, and I work for the Times of India. I, I can't talk about my newspaper, but I certainly don't work for the BJP. Okay. My question is, Mr. Soz, you wrote some time back in Times of India that this will be 2019 will be the last elections. You were attacked a lot, I know. But do you have you changed your view, or do you have a hope that you no, know, there will be an election? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm actually I'm glad we took your question. <laughs> okay, now Salman, very quickly. Uh, I think the Kashmir question you'll have to take it uh, take it offline. Uh, on your question, what the you know he you mentioned something about whether it's anti Modi itself which will make us win, which, which I can tell you straight away. Uh, frankly speaking, in 2014, I respectfully disagree with you i don't think i don't think modi won it the congress lost it most often a government in power loses it so if you are going to tell me that we are not going to criticize modi for demonetization oh i will criticize modi for demonetization i will criticize modi for gst i will criticize modi for jobs i will criticize modi for the rural economy i will criticize and condemn him for the lynchings I will condemn him for the way he's divided society. That's not called anti-Modiism. I think the, what has happened is that there has been a political party that has tried to fracture and divide India. You want me to be silent on that? Please, for God's sake. And India will vote on it. Let India decide. The Congress party is going to make a passionate cause to say this is about the whole idea of India, which is secular, liberal, plural, progressive, and tolerant. And we need to keep it that way no matter what. It doesn't matter. No political party wins forever. No political party is permanently going to be there. If we win in 2019, there's no guarantee we'll be there in 24. Similarly, Modi is not forever. So let's bite that. Over to you. Inflation and your question, sir, on Kashmir, he will take it off the line if you don't mind because he can share it. Yes. And yes. the public's inflation, public sector, and will there be a last election on IBC? Okay. okay. Short and sweet. Uh, just uh, one more point on your question. Uh, uh, I think in one respect, I do agree with you that, uh, yes, uh, uh, an anti-government message has percolated because people feel it. But we also have to go with a uh, positive agenda. And I I'm very, very grateful for what the Congress Party has done this time with the, with the manifesto. It, has in, it is a very, very good manifesto. I, I recommend that you read it. Some of the best things in there are about individual freedoms. You know, uh, uh, I think everybody's individual freedoms are impinged, not just by this government, you know, any officer, any police wala. But now I think the kinds of uh, uh, promises made on individual freedoms are very important. The private sector and how it should be leading that is very important, defining the role of the public sector and focusing on public goods, which actually goes to your question on the public sector units, uh, some really good things, uh, and we're trying to take that message uh, to the people. So you should definitely, please, I encourage you, just look at the two manifestos, make up your mind that, you know, if that's one way to make up your mind. As far as your question on inflation and its relationship to uh, economic uh, growth is concerned, or GDP is concerned, uh, actually, a real GDP is actually calculated after you take care of inflation. Even though inflation right now is low, definitely compared to the times of uh, the UPA. And by the way, under Mr. Bajpayee, inflation was low. It wasn't high. It was higher in UPA. It's low now. But one of the biggest reasons for that, and I uh, reflect that in the book, and this is not me saying, uh, all experts will say this, uh, that uh, uh, lower crude prices, which sh declined sharply, uh, uh, and that was good for the country. Uh, that happened, uh, uh, you know, uh, that, that has led to, uh, in large measure, uh, to lower inflation. And one more thing that has le led to lower uh, food price inflation is a, 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 a minimum support price for, for, for farmers has uh, been kept very low by the Modi government. And that actually hurt farmers when, remember those two monsoon failures I talked about? That is the time the Modi government implemented a totally obnoxious a minimum support price uh, policy that hurt farmers at that time. They should not have done that. That, that hurt rural... And Salman, if I can just add a point there, that a low inflation is not always a good thing, by the yeah, way. Yeah, by the way a low good. inflation with a low demand is exactly what you're facing yeah, yeah. today. So that's not a good sign. That is a bad it's not thing. necessarily a good so, sign. So GDP growth, if anybody says that GDP growth is the highest now since independence because inflation is low, they're actually misleading you because GDP growth is always calculated after you take out inflation. So even if UPA, imagine if UPA inflation was high, which it was, but GDP growth was very high, that means 
uh, the uh, difference between the nominal GDP and the inflation was taken into account. Uh, uh, the growth rate right now is nowhere, nowhere. I mean, if you do some regular, yeah. yeah. So, so that they're misleading you. But the point he's making is a very valid one. If you have high growth, you'll have to live with some degree of inflation, I guess. Yeah. There is, yeah. yeah. But now on public sector, if you remember, uh, uh, there were many um, uh, intellectuals who supported Prime Minister Modi. Uh, during his campaign, especially since his time in Gujarat. Uh, by the way, that uh, whole term of minimum uh, government, maximum governance, I actually trace it back to a 2008 article in Pragati magazine by uh, 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 Professor Asher, uh, who's based out of Singapore, who's a Modi supporter. Uh, but they didn't really do any of that. In, in fact, Air India was, uh, has been bleeding for a long time, and uh, it has been uh, propped up by taxpayer money. and. Uh, Many people question whether the government should be in the business of flying planes or running hotels. Why is Ashoka Hotel, for example, sitting on prime property in New Delhi uh, and not run well? Why should it be? So these are legitimate debates we should be having. I personally, I, not my party, I personally believe that uh, we should disinvest from many uh, of these uh, central uh, public sector undertakings. And by the way, in the Congress manifesto, there's a clear line that non-core public sector undertakings at the central government level, there would be disinvestment from there. Let the private sector handle those things. Let the taxpayer not be bled anymore uh, in those kinds of things. But the strategic uh, public sector undertakings like ONGC and others, they're doing very well. They were doing well till, till money was taken out of those. LIC was doing well till money was taken out of LIC. Uh, but by the way, people just don't know the kind of damage that has happened, uh, yeah. that has been done to the balance sheets of LIC. Well, well BSNL uh, is laying off 55,000 people. So, you know, that, that's, that's the magic of propaganda. That's the magic of money and business coming together. Big business, not a regular business. Yeah. Your question on IBC and then the... IBC, IBC you know, uh, good idea, good concept, uh, had come in with a lot of hope, but right now it's uh, uh, now facing problems. You're right. And I think, like... Many things in this country, there is elite capture, and I, I fear that we're going down that, the, the path that you're talking about where uh, big companies come in, they try to eat, take up distressed assets. Uh, and by the way, not everybody who fails in business is a fraud. Most people are just trying to make money. So it is wrong to say that everybody or every business is, not every business is chore, okay? Most businesses, most people are honest people. Things happen. Businesses fail. But, please, uh, but, but just a minute, just a minute, sir, just to answer the but, question. But there is, there is a list of people who were declared frauds by the Reserve Bank of India. That list was sent to the Prime Minister. He did not act on that. That is a question that the Prime Minister should answer, but he will never answer that. Now, and on, the last question is on that... On Times of India, after that article, you're right, I mean, that article actually... <laughs> Uh, took on a life of its own. I basically made the argument that if two, in 2019 the BJP wins like they did in 2014, there would be no 2024 election. Uh, after that, Times of India has not accepted any of my articles, by the way. <laughs> but I, I still believe uh, I still believe that to be true. At the same time, I see zero chance of that happening anymore because this election is very tight. And let me put it across like this, he's being as typically modest. In this election, I have a feeling the liberal, the secular, the progressive, the tolerant, the inclusive India will win. This election will be won. And, and let me tell you, change begins with that belief and that faith. All right? Change begins with that belief and faith. And I think Indian democracy is not going to surrender to the whims of any authoritarian fascist. I think we remain very optimistic. I want to let you know that Salman Soz has come all the way from Delhi because he believes that he told me that Mumbai is, is just got such a very enlightened people to kind of share thoughts with. I know you had a question, sir. I know many of you had a question. So maybe as we wrap up, uh, please give a warm round of applause once again to Salman. It's been a lovely conversation. Salman, I hope you have enjoyed being here. And uh, please, when you do the Q&A, Ravi, all of you, you can just kind of... Uh, thank you very much. No, no, it's all right. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, over to you. So, thank you all. Thank you, audience. Thank you, Salman. Thank you, Sanjay. The books are available in the counter. You can buy it and get it signed with him and take the pictures also.
So thank you, Tidal Waves. Thank you, Sumit, for getting the uh, push in the social media. Thank you, Ajitab, for the creatives. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Jay Kumar, for arranging the catering part of it. Thank you. Bye. Good night and good evening. Thanks.